today's webinar is titled An Introduction to Targeted Learning for Causal Inference with Real-World Data. And our speaker is Dr. Mark Vanderlaan, who is the Jan Ping Chu Carl E. Peace Professor in Biostatistics and Statistics at UC Berkeley, where he developed targeted learning, targeted maximum likelihood estimations, and super learning. Mark has received many honors for his work over the course of his career, including the COPS President's Award, the Mortimer Spiegelman Award, and the Van Danzig Award. Mark, I want to thank you for speaking with us today. Yeah, thank you very much, Susan, for the uh, introduction. And thank you uh, for everybody attending this. So yeah, this talk will be about targeted uh, machine learning for causal inference uh, based on real-world uh, data. And the first thing I want to do is go over what we refer to as the roadmap of statistical learning, which really is, is the foundational way uh, one should learn from data. And it involves a number of steps. And uh, the first step is, of course, the realization that what we observe, our observed data, is the realization of an experiment. And therefore, it's a random variable. And we will actually use the notation O1 till ON for the random variable we observe on each subject or each unit. And then we'll use the notation P0 for the true probability distribution of the data. Uh, so then the question becomes, okay, what do we know about the probability distribution of the data? And that's called a statistical model. So that represents restrictions you are uh, willing to put on this probability distribution. Uh, such as when we say normal mu sigma square, we clearly are restricting the density to a certain shape. Uh, this is supposed to be done in a way uh, that, uh, so that the true probability distribution of the data actually respects that these assumptions and satisfies it. Um, so that's why we refer to this as you want to model your observed data realistically. The set of possible uh, densities or probability distributions of the data, we use the notation uh, script M, calligraphic M. Uh, and uh, so you're then making the statement that the true distribution is in there. Uh, so here we start distinguishing from the more traditional statistics where we often use as statistical models, things like logistic regression or linear regression or Cox proportion hazards regression. So these are all making assumptions about the data distributions, about the relations which are uh, simplistic and are not realistic. Uh, Contrary to that, we would actually uh, don't avoid such assumptions and only make assumptions which we can defend. And, and so that might be things like knowing that your treatment only depends on certain covariates or that your censoring decision at any point in time is only based on following variables. So these are kind of conditional independence assumptions and they are uh, important, but that's how far typically these statistical models uh, go. Then the next question becomes, what is the estimate? What are you trying to learn uh, about the data distribution? And uh, in this case, we don't have coefficients because we don't have parametric models. So we actually have to really carefully define uh, what, what is that feature of the true probability distribution which we are trying to learn. And to make that explicit, we talk about a mapping, right? It's a mapping psi, we call, use the notation, which maps a candidate probability distribution of the data, candidate density of the data into a number or maybe a vector of numbers, which represents uh, your answer to the question of interest. And uh, so that's psi P0 would represent the estimate. Um, you want to choose the estimate so that it actually answers, like for example, the causal question of interest. So this is actually where the field of causal inference comes in. Uh, the field of causal inference allows us to talk about hypothetical experiments. Uh, so what would uh, the rate of death have been if uh, we would have intervened uh, in a certain way on our population? Uh, so these are so-called counterfactual uh, outcomes. And we can define uh, causal quantities of interest, such as the, the mean uh, of, of potential outcomes of the treatment and then control, or maybe take a difference. So causal models, Name and Rubin model or structure equation models allow us to define these uh, uh, factual outcomes defined by an intervention. And uh, 
and define causal quantities such as a contrast uh, of these different uh, treatment specific uh, distributions. And then we are also concerned by saying, okay, but can we actually learn this from the data? Is there, is there a way to go from the probability issue data to that causal quantity? And that's called identification. And so a big component of causal inference is about establishing identification results for interesting causal quantities. Uh, and so there are lots of well-known results uh, based on assumptions like no image confounding or sequential randomization assumptions and these type instrumental variable type assumptions and so on. Uh, but either way, so that exercise is in a, about utilizing causal models and identification based on certain observed data experiments is results then in an estimate in something you can learn from the data, which then equals that causal quantity if you are willing to believe these causal assumptions. Now, once you have done that exercise, you then have, in fact, an estimate in your hand, which, you know, equals that causal quantity, at least if you believe the assumptions or you're willing to say, you know, this is reasonable enough. And so by now we have then defined that mapping psi, which gives the estimate. So that's what we say. That's about the query about the stochastic system. Um, actually, at that point, you can ignore uh, now it becomes a pure statistical estimation problem, and you can, in, for the time being, ignore the whole causal modeling and the identification. So that, it's a completely separate thing, statistical estimation. And, and so these kind of non-testable assumptions you need for identification of causal effects can be ignored. Then we have uh, to come up with an estimator. And an estimator uh, is a mapping from the data into a number, uh, and, and that's itself has to be an a priori specified algorithm. Um, and so why a priori specified? Because then we, it's, we can understand its sampling distribution. We could, for example, bootstrap or there are theoretical ways to establish what this estimator uh, behavior is, stochastic behavior. Uh, and so we can establish results such as consistency and asymptotic normality and so on. Um, again, in practice, we often see that uh, as that many analyses are based on on detective work and trying this, trying that, and, and that it does not result in an actual estimator by the formal definition, and that's problematic because that results in all kinds of biases uh, which make it impossible to establish, establish if something is real signal or, or just due to the way this process uh, took place. Now, once we have an a priori specified estimator, we also uh, can talk about convolution intervals. So we can uh, use the theory for the estimator uh, to establish uh, that uh, to establish convolution intervals, which then, with 95% uh, probability, contain the true answer. So that's called the roadmap of statistical learning. Uh, to actually do this, to carry out this roadmap in the context where your statistical model is truly realistic, so you're only trying to make assumptions such as maybe independence or IID data and that kind of thing, is actually a real challenge. And that is why we uh, called it this kind of uh, field of construction of uh, estimators of the data distribution, like density of the data, such that the corresponding client estimates of your target estimate are well behaved, so they're, they're behave are asymptotically and normally distributed, then we can get composite intervals and all that. Doing that based on realistic statistical models, we call that field targeted learning. Uh, this by necessity involves machine learning uh, because you have to data adaptively learn relations uh, between like the outcome and the treatment and the covariates or other stochastic relations of how the future depends on the past. And uh, yeah, since we are not assuming particular parametric forms, we have to let the data speak on that and learn it. So now we're getting into how do we mix, how do we make, combine machine learning in a way that we can still get inference. And, and that, that's really what targeted uh, learning, in particular target makes some likelihood it's called, is able to do, to utilize the state of the art of machine learning and then still provide formal inference for your estimate. So what are the ingredients in a schematic way of targeted learning? Uh, you, uh, you, if, if we care about causal uh, effects of interest, then we would first use the causal models uh, 
and the causal identification results to define and uh, yeah, and closest and target estimates, which equals that causal quantity uh, under certain uh, assumptions, typically non-testable assumptions. Uh, so now we know what the statistical estimate is. Now we need to, that will depend on relations such as the probability, let's say we'll, the simple example we'll, we'll use in this talk is uh, where we observe on every subject covariates and binary treatment and outcome. And for example, we might care about the average treatment effect and that will depend on, to learn that you have to know the probability of the outcome like death as a function of the treatment and the covariates. Uh, so that's where machine learning would then be needed. Uh, so that's an important step to learn these uh, conditional uh, probabilities of death as a function of the past. And then uh, that's not enough. That's uh, where we then also carry out a targeted update, which is an extra data fitting step, which takes the machine learning fit as an offset and does some extra fitting uh, using relatively standard parametric models, like a logistic regression model using as offset your current machine learning fit for that prediction function. And then with a standard maximum likelihood along that parametric model that gives us the target maximum likelihood update of that prediction function. And then we can evaluate our target estimate. And that's then the target maximum likelihood estimator. And then we also have theory for that where it, we know it behaves like an empirical mean. We say the estimator is asymptotically linear. Uh, in other words, the TMLE of the average stream effect, let's say, minus the true estimate, behaves like an empirical mean of a uh, function of the data on each unit. That's called the influence curve. And so then we also know by the central limit theorem that it converges to a normal distribution and we can estimate the variance. And so we get the inference. And so that all comes uh, out of uh, that as well. Uh, so you see here in uh, all these ingredients coming uh, together. Uh, so target learning is something which started uh, with an initial paper in 2006 and, and before that, we were already doing the super learning and machine learning uh, cross validation results. And so by now, there's a lot of work has been done. And in particular, two books have been written on the topic, one in 2011 and, and recently in 2018, the target of learning and data science with lots of contributions from uh, uh, people working in this area. OK, so to demonstrate this general template for construction of uh, plug-in efficient estimators of causal quantities right through uh, really target estimates which then equal their causal quantity and identification assumptions. Uh, let's use a particular example uh, and that's the one I already mentioned that we observe uh, on a, like a sample of n subjects uh, which are a random sample from some population let's say and for every subject we observe covariates w, a binary treatment a, uh, and a final, let's say, binary outcome Y. Let's say we don't assume anything uh, about the distribution, the probability of the outcome Y, like death as a function of the treatment and the covariates. And we also don't know anything about the distribution of the covariates. And maybe we know something about how the treatment was a function of the characteristics of the person. Uh, so we might know that treatment was assigned by medical doctors and they, based on that, we can talk to them and find out how they usually make these decisions. So that might help us to say that treatment really only depends on one or two or three covariates. So that would be incredible helpful information uh, if that's the case. Uh, so that defines then the statistical model. That's all we know. And then we can define the estimate. And then, you know, you, you can go through this roadmap of defining and causal quantity, like the average treatment effect. So you act like in the name and rumor model, you act as if for every subject there's a Y0 and a Y1. Uh, is an outcome under treatment, an outcome under control. And you say, I really would like to know what would have been uh, the average of the individual causal effects for the population. So Y1 minus Y0 would be the uh, causal effect for a single person. And then you average that across the population to get the average treatment effect. So that might be something you say uh, in quantity you might care about. Then we can show uh, by assuming that your observed data corresponds with observing one of these counterfactuals, namely the one corresponding with the treatment you got. And uh, that gives you then an identification results under the so-called randomization assumption. Uh, and that's the one stated here on this slide, which is psi of p, 
which says that this average treatment effect actually equals this particular feature of the probability distribution the data defined by getting the probability of death as a function of treatment and covariates for every covariate strata set, set uh, computed under treatment, computed under control, take the difference. So you get the difference of these two conditional probabilities of death under treatment and control within that strata W and then average over the probability distribution of the, stra of the covariate strata. That's now your expression, your target estimate, uh, which is the uh, which then equals this average treatment effect if you are uh, willing to assume that treatment uh, was randomized conditional on the covariate strata W and some positive assumption. So what would in team Lee now do? Uh, in team Lee would actually, and we'll get more into how it works, but uh, to actually have a very concrete uh, example of what team Lee does in this case. It just uses, uh, like machine learning, we will use, talk about ensemble machine learning. It would estimate the probability of death as a function of the treatment and the covariates, uh, like logistic regression type estimated, and, uh, and uses cross-validation to select the best one. And then it says, okay, we need to do a little target maximum likelihood step. So what we do, we use this prediction function from this machine learning fit uh, as an offset in a logistic, simple logistic regression model with a single clever covariate. Uh, so just univariate logistic regression. And the clever covariate uh, comes from yeah, knowing uh, so-called canonical gradient of that estimate. Uh, and, but either way, it comes down to using a clever covariate. Uh, when a person is treated, it will be one over the propensity score. And if a person is not treated by control, then it's minus one over one minus the propensity score. And so that's then gives you a column in your data matrix, right, where you now have your column for an outcome, you have a column for the offset, which is your current prediction function based on super learner fit, and then you have a column of the clever covariate, and you run a simple univariate logistic regression with the offset, and that gives you an update. And that's the target mix like update of this prediction function. And then you are done. Then you evaluate your estimate. In other words, you evaluate now the probability of death the treatment and control for every covert strategy you take the empirical average. And that's the target maximum likelihood uh, estimate. So it gives a sense uh, how it works. So target learning is, uh, as you can tell, is taking together the advances of uh, causal modeling and identification results, uh, allowing you to define these causal quantities of interest and then corresponding estimates, which approximate them the best you can based on your data. Uh, we are utilizing the state of the art of machine learning. You actually bring it all together in, in an ensemble uh, approach, which is stronger than all its ingredients. And then we also bring in the state of uh, yeah, deep statistical theory, uh, from, which has, of course has a long tradition in statistics uh, to actually uh, figure out this targeting step and, and also have this theory, which tells us that these estimates are indeed well-behaved and are uh, optimal. So at the end, better answers to causal, like actionable questions with uh, quantification, uh, accurate quantification of uncertainty. Okay, so one of the, uh, when you want to construct, uh, when you have like an estimate like the average treatment effect, then the first step is, is uh, you have to learn, probably not the whole density of the data, but usually the density of the data, if the data is time ordered, so you can factorize your uh, likelihood of the data by writing down this product of conditional probabilities of what happens at the next time point given what you observed in the past, so in a product over time. And then certain of these conditional uh, factors of the likelihood you have to learn from the data to, to identify this, to get to this estimate. Mm -hmm. uh, but others maybe you don't need at all. Like we saw with the average treatment effect, what we need is this covariate distribution, but that's easy, that's just we take the empirical. And then we also need the conditional probability of the outcome on death as a function of treatment and covariates. And, uh, but we didn't need for that purpose, uh, like for example, the conditional probability of treatment given the covariates. Um, on the other hand, we actually will also need that part for the targeting. So the first step is to learn that prediction function you need for this uh, estimate, which in this case would be probability of death as a function of treatment and covariates. And for that, we then use ensemble uh, machine learning. So how does that work? 
uh, it works by this by the approach what we what's called cross validation. So what you do, you when you want to, for example, learn this prototype of death as a function of treatment and cohort, you could come up with a whole bunch of paramedic logistic regression models, but you could also come up with lots of machine learning algorithms. And many machine learning algorithms have all kinds of choices, like tuning parameters. Uh, so there's poten potential for different screening uh, approaches before you even run the machine learnings, again, giving more and more machine learning algorithms. So there's a whole range uh, and a very large possible algorithms you could use to learn this uh, conditional probability of death. But in the end, you have no idea which one works best for your data, because that will all depend on the sample size. It will depend on how, how complex the truth is. It will, uh, so at the end, it's depending on what the truth function truly is and what the sample size is and other things, one algorithm will perform better than another. So what we do, we build this rich library of candidate machine learning algorithms we run them on nine tenths of the data, let's say, that's tenfold cross validation. So you split your sample in 10 blocks, you run it on nine tenths, and then you evaluate on the left out one tenth how well the algorithm is actually predicting on these left out subjects. And so that gives, for that, of course, we need a loss function, like how do you evaluate the performance on a left out patient, how well the algorithm is predicting. And that could be for if you go after the conditional probability of, of uh, like death, you could use the log likelihood loss, but you could also use the squared error loss, uh, uh, as long as it is a loss which that if you would, that is valid for the object you're trying to learn. And so for a conditional mean or a conditional probability, these, these are two valid uh, loss functions. And uh, so that gives you now a measure of performance for each algorithm on the left out data. Uh, then you can do that in a tenfold way. So you have 10 times, Yes, you make your uh, training sample nine tenths of the data, and then the left out part is the validation. So you get 10 measures of performance for every algorithm, and you take the average of that, and that is then the cross validated risk, right? Cross validated mean squared error, cross validated log likelihood for each algorithm in your library. And then you say, let's choose the winner, and, and simply the one which was best in uh, perform best on left out data when it was trained on the on the training data. Now that winner is then the one you use and you could then rerun it on the whole data and that gives you uh, what we call then uh, a uh, yeah, super learner. It's the, and uh, there are different ways of doing this. You can say we call that the discrete super learner. If you just grab the best algorithm among your collection of algorithms. But you can also decide to say, you know, I want to even augment my set of possible algorithms by looking at all weighted combinations, like all convex combinations of these algorithms, and then you choose the best weighted combination. So it's just still the same principle. You have then a continuous family of algorithms, but you still evaluate each one by its cross validated risk uh, performance and then choose the winner. Uh, it might sound complicated that you are looking to choosing the best one among all convex combinations as if that's a huge undertaking, but it's not. It just means that you run at the meta level, we call it, where your outcomes are just the usual outcomes, but then your, your covariates become the uh, different candidate algorithms prediction functions trained on the training data, and then you run a standard regression at that meta level, maybe under the constraint of convex, uh, that the coefficients have to sum up to one and are positive, that kind of thing. And so it's a very fast thing, and, and that gives you then the best weighted combination. Uh, when you do super learner, it, it all depends on what your goal is, right? What is your what's the function you're trying to learn? And uh, that will do, define, of course, your loss, but also um, there are then still different types of uh, optimality criteria you might come up with, such as, uh, you know, you might have resource constraints or you might uh, want to minimize the false negatives under certain rates for false positives. So there's, uh, depending on what your real goal is for that prediction function, you could tune, you could choose your performance measure uh, in that manner. So that the competition is truly measuring, uh, the performance is really measuring what you care about. Uh, so, Here's just a simple, an example from the intensive uh, care uh, mortality prediction for from the intensive care unit uh, patients were 
people uh, use uh, use certain simple scores to make predictions, um, but you can also actually do much better. And so we use the super learner. This was published in the Lancet, and you can see here the error in the curve for the different algorithms, including the super learner. It's a little small, but the super learner has an, a performance of 0.88. Uh, um, while some of the simple things uh, are significantly worse. So there was a big relative gain, as you visually can see here. So why is cross-validation used right, as, as a way of combining these estimated and, and, and mapping this library of estimates into a new estimate, which is actually better than all these ingredients? And that's because of the theory for the cross-validation selector, right, the, the selector which chooses the candidate algorithm, which is the winner in this uh, competition. And, and uh, it's based on some kind of oracle inequality. Uh, but the key, uh, one of the implications of that uh, oracle inequality for the cross validation selector is that if you, that if you, uh, that you can define so-called oracle selector. So what you can do, you have this loss uh, function and the expectation of that loss, which is called the risk uh, for a candidate estimator, you can subtract from that the expectation of the loss under the optimal prediction function, the one you're try really trying to go after, which is minimizing that risk. Uh, that creates dissimilarity. For example, if you do this with the squared error loss, uh, this becomes an L2 norm squared, right? an L2 norm of the candidate estimator minus the true function squared. Uh, and so, that loss-based dissimilarity is like uh, is a you can then say what would the oracle select you can define that as choosing the algorithm so that when it's trained on training samples it has the closest distance closest this uh, smallest dissimilarity to the truth and that's uh, if you choose that one yeah that's then your oracle selector of course that's cheating but you an interesting question would then be you have then the real cross validation selector, which is really based on the data, and you have this Oracle selector, and you can ask yourself, what is the, if I take the loss-based dissimilarity of the cross validated select estimator and the true function, and I divide that by the loss-based dissimilarity of the Oracle select uh, estimator and the true function, what, how does that behave? No, and you can prove that that actually will converge to one. Uh, and that even, com which means you're doing exactly as well as I'm talking about the Oracle Selector, which is remarkable, because that's, I mean, you know, that's a very clever guy. Uh, but nonetheless, that's happening, and it even happens when the number of candidate algorithms in your library grows polynomial in sample size. And, uh, and at the end of the day, the only condition you need for this is that the loss function, like the squared error or whatever it looks like, is a bounded uh, function. So you cannot have that one guy or one subject has a huge uh, outlier with respect to loss. And so that's why you have to kind of make sure your data is bounded. And there are no crazy uh, outliers. But once you take care of that, this uh, theoretical performance of the cross like select is, is remarkable. It's optimal, cannot be beaten. And, uh, but also, actually, it works in finite samples very well, because cross relation is kind of made for finite samples. It really evaluates on your actual sample how well you're doing. So crossway is quite a remarkable uh, method, and uh, thus, uh, and that's why we talk about superlearner, right? The, because it really proves that with this approach of ensemble learning, you're doing as well as the oracle, uh, uh, and that is uh, why we call it superlearning. Okay, so then in the end of the day, when you use superlearner, you're as good as your library, right? The best choice in your library. So if your library is not interesting, you have only poor algorithms, you're still not having pretend great algorithm. It's better, but it's not necessarily great. So one of the so that's why you want to include in your library a diverse set of algorithms that again that could include parametric models, that's perfectly fine, and a whole range from more and more aggressive. But you you also like to include a, a, like an algorithm or multiple algorithms which are guaranteed to actually really be able to converge to the true function and approximate the true function. As sample size increases. Now, for that purpose, uh, we have developed a machine learning algorithm we call highly adaptive lasso. And uh, this is uh, really nothing else than, for example, with the probability of death as a function of the treatment in the covariance, we would be using a logistic regression uh, with many, many basis functions. And the basis functions are what we say tensor products 
of so-called splines. And, sp and the simple splines here are, like if you have a uh, covariant x1 and x2, you have the indicator x1 bigger than a cutoff. Right? So that's a function which goes from 0 to 1 at a certain knot point. That is then a particular spline. That's the non-smooth spline. And then you can have smoother and smoother splines. Uh, but in this case, we use the non-smooth spline, so that, which can have jumps. And so you have indicated x1 bigger than a cutoff for it. And our, our basis functions for all these different cutoffs, which are different knot points, but also indicated x2 bigger than a cutoff, our basis functions, and also the product of the two. The indicated x1 bigger than a knot point times indicated x2 bigger than a knot point across a whole bunch of knot points are also then base ones. So you get all these, these uh, tensor products of spline, simple spline basis functions, and, and you have an, a lot of them. You have n times 2 to the power d, where d is the dimension. So that is an incredible flexible model. And then you maximize your log likelihood or minimize your sum of squared residuals or whatever your loss function is. You minimize that over all these uh, linear combinations of basis functions under the constraint that the L1 norm of the vector of coefficients is bounded by some constant. And then you choose that constant by cross validation. So that's why we call it lasso. Uh, you can actually prove that that L1 norm is theoretic, is an actual, uh, is, 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 a, is nothing else than a so-called sectional variation norm of this multivariate function. So it's actually something which measures how variable the function is. And it happens to be with this base that, that happens to correspond with the L1 norm. Now, this is a remarkable algorithm uh, because you can prove that this algorithm is able to converge to the true function with respect to this uh, yeah, loss based dissimilarity, the square root of that, because it's always quadratic, uh, with a rate of n to the minus one third. And, and, and then there's a log n factor, but that's really all it is. So that means even when the dimension grows, the rate of convergence is still n to the minus one third. Of at least when the, when the dimension is large, it's still n to the one third. And, and um, that's, uh, that's a remarkable rate because this is not even making smoothness assumptions because the true function, all it has to be is has to be cat lag, right continuous left and limits, and has to have finite variation norm. So it's really a, a remarkable non parametric model in which still we are approximating the true function at this rate. Um, and the implications are important because when you now include this in the superlearner, you are guaranteed that your superlearner is doing at least as well as this highly adapted lasso. That means you're guaranteed to at least converge to the true function as sample size increases n to the one third. And that's a very key thing because when you look, do the theoretical analysis of like target maximum likelihood estimates, it will depend on a second order remainder and that second order remainder uh, will then behave like n to the minus two thirds, which is smaller than the usual one over square root sample size, and that means that your TMLE minus truth will truly behave like an empirical mean of independent uh, mean zero random variables so that you have the central limit theorem kicking in and all that. So you get the guaranteed asymptotic normality and efficiency of the TMLE by using such a good supervisor. Uh, so this hull is, you can use it, of course, to estimate logistic uh, functions like probabilities of death as a function of treatment and covariates, but you can also do it to estimate conditional densities or conditional hazards. Uh, and, and in fact, many times we can just utilize standard software, uh, like we have GLM Net, which has both family, has also the family as Cox. And so we could use uh, Cox lasso regression with this extensive basis and thereby fit in a very non parametric way the conditional hazard. And, and, and so this would be important if we want to do causal effects of a treatment on survival, like a treatment specific survival curve and the treatment and control and take a difference. And then we use to, to get to that, we would have to estimate that conditional hazard. And then we could use highly adaptive lasso and in particular super learner, including highly adaptive lasso and, and then do a little targeting. And then we get our uh, treatment specific survival curves and the causal effect on survival. So this is just uh, something we do as well. Okay, so uh, after you going back to the AT example, if you have learned the prediction function, uh, you still are not done. Uh, you might say, uh, I thought that it was such a good fit, this super learner. Problem is, it's not yet fit for the purpose of the estimates. It was doing a good job for fitting that whole function, that whole prediction function, which in a way is answering many, many questions. Uh, and uh, because you're, you're asking the, what's the prediction for all these different covariate strata. 
And that means you're spreading your errors across all these possible uh, questions you're trying to answer. But how you spread these errors matters for the particular estimate we are interested in, which is a very specific summary measure of that whole prediction function. And so it's not spread for that purpose yet. And that's what this next target makes some like it's that does. It, it will do a little update uh, along this parametric model using its offset or superlarger function, and then uh, start actually suddenly becoming a very good fit for the actual estimate. So it's still a very similar fit. It will have the same behavior as the super learner, but it's now better for that particular estimate you are interested in. And, so, and this target update is really crucial because it, it number one, it creates from an estimate, from a plugin estimator, which not even root, uh, not even root n. It's also not even absolute and normal. But once you do the targeting, it actually achieves the, the rate of, like of a sample mean, and it will start behaving like a sample mean, and therefore it's also normally distributed. So it's a very important uh, component, which provides the link from the machine learning to actually getting statistical inference for target estimates. Here's a visualization of how uh, TMLE works. If you, here we have a graph where we show this, this, this sphere, which is the statistical model, which contains this true probability distribution, P0. Uh, you might come up, you come up with an initial estimate of that density of the data or the relevant parts of it. We call that PN0, let's say. And that will be an initial density estimator, like the super learner. And then you, what you do is you create a little path through PN0, little parametric model, and do a little update with standard maximum likelihood that's called and then you get your p and star that's your target estimate of the density so your update is happening here uh, and that is then the density you're going to use to evaluate your target feature in this case like the average treatment effect and so that's how it works uh, how target maximum likelihood uh, works so then the question is you know, what is exactly that uh, update uh, so that's what we say here right we we have to determine mathematically the fluctuation strategy, we call it the least favorable submodel, uh, P and epsilon, meaning epsilon is a tuning parameter. If epsilon is zero, you get back your initial superlearner. If epsilon moves, you change your superlearner. Think about the clever code you add to the logistic regression using its offset, offset the superlearner. Right? When epsilon is zero, you're back to the superlearner. And when epsilon moves, you move, you change this prediction function. And the question is, how can I change it in such a way that if I look at the target estimates for that modified fluctuated prediction function? How would that change it? So and I'm looking for a way to change that super learner function so that the target that corresponding target estimate is changing maximally for small for like an, an infinitesimal small change in the epsilon. So that what that means is that for Every little change in epsilon, like you do a little fitting of epsilon, you get the maximal fitting uh, for uh, psi. Moving epsilon is like moving psi. And, and, and so it becomes the parametric maximum likelihood step where you fit the coefficient. That, uh, it becomes, in essence, like fitting the target estimate. That's why that maximum likelihood step is now doing a lot of uh, good. Um, to figure out, so, so that's what you kind of want. You want that your path is really such that a small change in epsilon corresponds to a maximal change in the estimate. Uh, but then if you work that out, that means you have to calculate the so-called gradient, the canonical gradient of this target estimate. And that's something we can do. That's a, so you look essentially at all pathwise derivatives along different paths, and you find the path which maximizes that pathwise derivative uh, with respect to um, normalized so that the parametrization of P and epsilon is not causing uh, trouble. And so that gives you the so-called canonical gradient of this pathwise derivative. It's not that different from like gradients of uh, multivariate functions people are used to in numerical algorithms and all that. Uh, and that canonical gradient is something we can calculate. And once we have that, we, what we need is we need a path so that the score of our path equals or spans that canonical gradient. And so once we have the canonical gradient, we can actually uh, also construct that path, that so-called least favorable path. And, and, and that will just be like a parametric model, like a logistic regression or a linear regression type uh, model, 
with just usually like a clever covert or that type of thing. Um, so we just fit that coefficient with maximum likelihood, and that gives us our update. And that also happens to solve the right score equation because the canonical gradient happens to be a score itself. And so your target maximum likelihood estimator, uh, after doing this MLE uh, uh, of the tuning of the epsilon, you you will actually be solving a score equation, which is the score is the canonical gradient. So you will solve the empirical mean of the canonical gradient at your uh, TMLE, and, and that is uh, allows us then to establish the asymptotic normality of the target maximum likelihood estimator and all that. So just like in standard parametric maximum likelihood, the reason why maximum likelihood estimators behave like nor like a normal distribution is because they solve score equations that allows us to do Taylor expansions and all that and show it behaves like an empirical mean. And so that type of proof is used for the TMLE as well. But we don't need to solve all score equations, we only need to solve the right score equation, and that happens to be the canonical gradient. Uh, regarding uh, the literature, right, there were in the literature going back to the 1970s, we have, uh, people have studied the, go, uh, the construction of efficient estimators, so estimators of target estimates, so that when you take the estimator minus the true estimator, estimate, it behaves like an empirical mean. We call these estimators asymptotically linear estimators. Why do we care about that? Because that means they're going to be consistent, but it also means they're going to be normally distributed so that we can get inference. And so uh, several general methods have been studied, uh, and one is the one-step estimator, where you take an initial estimator of your target estimates, like psi of pn, and you add the empirical mean of the canonical gradient. Uh, that's called the one-step estimator. Then you also have estimating equation estimators, so where you take the canonical gradient and you think of it as an estimating function. It depends on the psi and the nuisance parameter. Not always, but many times you can do that. And then you set the empirical mean of that canonical gradient equal to zero as an optimal estimating equation. It will depend on a nuisance parameter. You fit that, and then you solve for psi. So that's estimating equation-based estimation. And then TMLE, does it in a different way by saying, I'm going to do the update in the model space. So I get an estimate of the density and then update that density with a parametric fluctuation model and, 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 and do the uh, maximum likelihood estimator for that epsilon and then get your update. So TMLE is a general method that updates the initial uh, density estimator in an improved fit that solves any user supplied set of equations in particular, it can solve the canonical gradient equation, but it, you can add extra epsilons to make it solve other equations as well. And it happens to be a very powerful thing, allowing us to create very robust uh, TMLE with all kinds of even additional properties beyond being asymptotically efficient, uh, like higher order efficiency type properties and extra robustness. All these estimators have sample splitting analogs. Uh, like the, the one-step estimator goes back to the 70s. The first estimator was based on sample splitting. Uh, and then similarly, we have a CBT MLE also doing that. That's just a way to avoid a theoretical condition. It's called the Donsker class condition. Uh, and that makes these estimators uh, just one step more robust. And so that might be a general recommendation. Um, certainly, if you start using highly adaptive machine learning algorithms, uh, that's a recommended thing. Okay, so uh, so going back to the ATE uh, example, uh, we you can now say, okay, uh, how can we honestly evaluate in a simulation how well this target maximum likelihood estimator is doing for, let's say, estimating the average treatment effect? And one thing you can now do, because your super learner includes like a whole bunch of machine learning algorithms, like here in this example, random forest, neural nets, regression trees, uh, GAMs and, and so on, and also a gradient boosting. And, uh, but also a highly adaptive lasso is in there. And you say, okay, uh, I'm going to randomly sample a data distribution. So I'm randomly going to sample among a whole collection for data distributions of how A depends, how the treatment depends on the covariance, and how the outcome depends on the treatment and the covariance. And uh, then I'm going to sample from that. And then I run this super learner with all these algorithms, including the highly adaptive lasso, and do the TMLE update and see how well it does. Right? And then we do that across many draws of uh, different data gen mechanisms and using different sample size. So this is not in any way cheating because you're, you know, the algorithm we have set up is not 
does not care or does not know what the true data distribution is. Uh, it, and these true data distributions are sampled from a relatively weird space. We throw in all kinds of uh, cosines and sines and all kinds of weird functions and, and jumps and so on. Um, and so we can then see how well is this uh, team lead doing in this uh, setting for different dimensions of covariates. Um, here you see, uh, here we look at how um, what the kind of the average uh, absolute error is relative to the truth and how it's normalized by the kind of information in, this, in the data gen experiment. And you look at here the performance of the team lead using the super learner, that's the red one, and also team lead only using Hall. The highly adaptive loss so and then uh, and what you see here is actually that uh, the team lead only using Hall is doing the best and then uh, right after that very similar the team lead using super learner but if you would have done team lead only with some of these candidate machine learning algorithms uh, you do pay a price and, and you're starting to do uh, potentially significantly worse so there is really a benefit of utilizing super learner uh, and in particular Hall as a very powerful algorithm you can then also look at coverage, and here we see that uh, in this simulation, this goes up to dimensions 10, we are actually getting very good coverage, uh, up to 95% uh, coverage for a relatively uh, small sample size. And again, the SuperLearn and Hall do significantly, or do very well. And then uh, if you would have only used GLM, you pay a real price. Okay, so, um, so that's, uh, that's a, a remarkable performance, I must say, but that's also something you can explain uh, by the particular type of, uh, of these double robust estimation problems. They have particular behavior regarding a second order remainder, which there is a lot of cancellation. So in a way, this is better than you could have hoped for, but it, it's just the reality of these type of estimation problems that there's, that even when you cannot approximate a true function that well, there's still so much cancellation in the second order remainders that you still do remarkable well with respect to coverage. Uh, in many situations. Um, so uh, let's do a few more. Um, so this tells you now the overall story about what super learner and what target makes them like with this. Uh, we talked about the average treatment effect, how it works. Uh, you can also use uh, team or uh, targeted learning to uh, improve how we analyze uh, randomized trials. Many times randomized trials are kind of observational, right? There's always a centering and a missing as component. Uh, so in that sense, uh, these methods are still uh, very important to, to really adjust for confounders and so on appropriately and not rely on paramedic models. Uh, for example, this was in, uh, in the literature, there was this question about how to treat sepsis patients. And, and then there was the idea that uh, not just antibiotics, but also steroids could be helpful to combine them in treating. And people, over time, the community did a lot of tr trials, but none of these trials were able to show any benefit of the kind of steroids. And so it was kind of confusing to them. They kept trying, and, but they couldn't find any benefit for uh, mortality. And um, so Romain Paraccio, you know, it's trained in target learning and, and a, a, a medical doctor. He uh, used uh, TMLE to reanalyze like uh, three of the major uh, randomized trials. And, um, and you see at, at the bottom of this one, this is the red one, this, you see that now the estimate is like 80% relative risk, causal relative risk, right? So the probability of death and the treatment divided by the probability of death under control is 80%. So there is an improvement on average. Uh, and here the gain comes in particular from gaining efficiency by using super learner. And, uh, but also what you, what you can see is that in this data, the reason why they had so much trouble is there was actually a binary uh, covariate, which is with an effect heterogeneity, heterogeneity response to ACTH stimulation. And if you were a non-responder, this uh, steroid was actually good. But if you were a responder, this steroid was actually harmful. And so you had essentially two underlying groups in your population. For some of the treatment, the steroids was really helping, for others was not. And so uh, this also demonstrates uh, that there is real interest in maybe 
not just going for the static average treatment, the average treatment effect where you just compare always treat versus always control, but you might say, I'm interested in rules, like individualized treatment rules, which you can actually learn from the data by an a priori specified algorithm. And then also based on that same data in an honest way, say, okay, I have now fitted my individualized treatment rule, which maps a covert into a treatment decision. And I'm now going to evaluate what will be the mean outcome, what will be the death rate under that rule versus control. And that all can be done by an a priori specific algorithm. We just cross the target, make some likelihood for that. And here, this rule would then pick up this relatively simple uh, binary covert, which really has a drastic effect. And uh, you would then evaluate not always treat versus control, but carrying out this rule versus control. And then, of course, you get a big uh, signal, and you wouldn't this this kind of averaging out of good and bad wouldn't have happened. So that shows uh, there are all kinds of other exciting, interesting target estimates we could have defined, uh, even defined by an implicit algorithm, which you first have to run on the data. That type of stuff we can do as well. Um, let me see how I'm doing on time. Five more minutes, I think. Um, so we also use uh, for randomized trials uh, for adaptive designs, uh, where you sequentially or group sequential adaptive designs, uh, where you make your randomization probabilities for the next group. You first learn from the past data what kind of uh, treatment, how treatment should have been assigned based on the covariance, and then when there's evidence in that data analysis, you you then use uh, randomization problems which start adapting towards. Yeah, more the optimal rule. So they're still stochastic, they're still experimentation, but you start moving more and more towards uh, something which is really carrying out the optimal rule. Now, that type of adaptive designs, and there are other types of adaptations you could do, uh, can be beautifully analyzed with target mix and light estimation. They're completely robust, no model assumptions necessary, because the randomization problems, even though they're complex and they're adapted based on the past, they are known. And because they are known, the target mix and light estimator during the target mix like a step, all the bias gets removed because they are of this double robust nature. Uh, and, and therefore, you still get completely unbiased estimators of you know, in your mean outcome and your, uh, your best estimate of the optimal dynamic treatment so far relative to the, uh, like to, let's say, control. So there's a lot of work in this arena as well. This is also called the multiple bandit problem of reinforcement learning. And so Team Lee plays a very key role there by not having any reliance on paramedic models, all because of the targeting step being able to remove and all the bias either way. The super learning is just for the sake of gaining efficiency and, and also, in this case, for learning the optimal rule the best you can. Uh, so we can also use targeted learning for any kind of data structure. And this is like right sense of survival data very typical for like phase three type clinical trials. You can define what the counterfactual survival curve would be if we would have assigned treatment according to a rule like DW. It's the identification result is presented here for that. And, and so you can do a team lead for that, which would mean that you have to estimate a conditional hazard of survival as a bunch of treatment and covariance. For that, we can use Hall and SuperLearner. And then we can do the targeting step. And the, the targeting step is essentially a logistic regression. Uh, and I show it here. This is a logistic regression for the conditional hazard if we have discrete time. Otherwise, we can use COX, but it, because it's a standard paramedic model, but then you use the right clever covert to do the targeting step. And that clever covert comes from the canonical gradient of the estimate you are interested in. And in this case, that's this kind of time dependent covert, which, you know, I'm not going to overwhelm you, but here it's presented. It's part of the canonical gradient, which has this structure of like an indicator of observing a failure minus its conditional uh, hazard uh, times a function of the path. And that's the typical martingale structure of these uh, scores. You, you know from these paramedic, like Cox models and whatever. Uh, and, and that's what you see. The canonical brain is such a score. And so you can just look at that covert in front of that residual. And that's the time dependent covert you would put in this, this uh, so-called least favorable model which allows you, and now you do a simple target maximum likelihood right, using the super learner as offset and, and, and you're done. And then you have your targeted conditional hazard. And now you evaluate, use that conditional hazard to evaluate the treatment specific survival curve and the treatment and control and take a difference. And, and that will be your team and we get the inference from the canonical gradient. 
Uh, we also do this for very general longitudinal uh, observed data, right? This work with Romain Neugebauer. But you, you were, so now the data structures are, are, are having it's not baseline covariates treatment, but then intermediate at different time points, time dependent covariates, maybe treatment again or censoring, and, then, and so on. So you have these completely general longitudinal data structures. You have to say what are the intervention nodes you're trying to control. In this case, you have treatment at baseline, but maybe also treatment at multiple time points. And certainly, many times you have censoring indicators, which also are essentially intervention nodes you want to intervene on. So that's why we often code A of T, the intervention node, as in A1 of T and A2 of T. And A1 is the indicator of being treated, and A2 is the indicator of being right censored. And you uh, are then interested in questions, what would the final outcome Y have been, like at the survival rate, in the world where you intervene on all these intervention nodes, like set censoring to no censoring, because you don't want some kind of imputed outcome, and also set the treatment according to your intervention. Now, uh, we then have, again, very general uh, identification results. It's called the G computation formula. Which, uh, which corresponds with writing down your likelihood according to this time order and replacing these conditional distribution of the intervention nodes, A of T given the past, by your intervention you are interested in. And that gives a new likelihood. It's called, uh, that's the post, and that's under causal assumptions, the post intervention distribution. You would have seen if you would have intervened that way. And then you can say, under that post intervention distribution, I want to know what the marginal survival rate is, uh, the mean of the outcome. But that is, defines now these causal quantities and corresponding target estimates. They're definitely much more complex because they have all these, back, uh, these feedback loops uh, kicking in. But at the end of the day, it just becomes, again, an estimation problem. We have to learn how the future depends on the past. And for that, we need machine learning and also do targeting uh, towards the estimate. And then miraculously, you know, you get this targeted targeting step, which is able to remove all the bias, even when all the initial estimators are wrong, if you do a good job on the targeting step, which you know depends on then the treatment mechanism and the center mechanism. So, uh, and then you can answer very exciting questions like we do with Kaiser data, where we want to know different, comparing different rules for controlling glucose level and, and what the effect, impact of that is on the survival curve for these patients. And so, Mark, you can, yeah, um, I think we're at the top of the hour. We're just over. I think we need to stop there. Yeah, I agree, and I'm done actually. Uh, so uh, there's just a few more slides, and, and I had a concluding slide. So this is perfect. Thank you.